Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Loop Live. Um, I'll just wait a few seconds as people drop in. Um, but it would be great if we could find out where you're um, tuning in from. You can just pop it in the chat um, and see see who we've got there with us. Um, uh, just by ways of introduction, I am Liam and I'm VP of Marketing here. Um, at Cognizant, and with me, I have Jamie Skeels, who is a senior demand gen manager here at Cognizant too. Hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, not sure if we've got some repeat visitors to uh, the loop. Um, and if we do, welcome back. And if not, then yeah, welcome to um, the the show um, where we talk about loads of different marketing uh, topics. So, I'll get ready to get started. I think we've probably got most people in now and other people can drop in a couple minutes late if they need to. It looks like we've got people from all over, lots from London and some people all the way from Texas. So that's amazing. Um, so today we're going to be talking about creating memorable marketing. Um, so first, why do we need to be memorable? So uh, memory and recall is important for B2B marketers. And we believe this because of uh, B2B buyer behavior has changed. So now we feel that buyers want to be able to research independently before getting in touch with a salesperson. I think long gone are the, the days where uh, buyers felt the need uh, to speak to a salesperson straight away or you know, desired to do that um, as soon as possible. Now we all like to go out and do our research sort of independently and find out as much information as possible before we actually we speak to sales. And that's simply just because of um, <clears throat> the way the world works now, it's changed. No longer do you need to get all of your information from sales. You can find a lot of it online easily through um, review sites, through other trusted uh, sources just by doing a Google search and reading all of the information that's on there available from competitors as well. Uh, it's really easy to connect with your peers on LinkedIn um, and lots of different um, ways that you can now get that information without actually having to speak to a salesperson who you might deem to be biased for one um, and not give you the exact information um, that you need. Um, so because of that, uh, buyers now start um, researching uh, and end up with like a small set uh, of businesses that they can recognize and recall. So you're constantly sort of researching, constantly sort of learning, and you always have like a, a, a few subset of businesses that sort of stay top of mind. So marketing can go a long way in driving the growth of a product or brand just by making sure that you are one of those uh, me brands that is remembered and memorable in the mind. So. Uh, as long as you're in that top subset of like top of mind for for customers and prospects, then you're going to really drive demand for your business. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that you know, mark when we're marketing, we're actually we're trying to market to the people who aren't ready to buy now. So that's you know, 95% of people are currently are sat there, not really look ready to look at your solution or interested in purchasing it. And 5% might be ready there to be captured. So it's actually that 95% that we're trying to stay top of mind for that whole time. So that when they do move in market to be that 5% uh, into that 5% of in market uh, buyers, um, you're going to be the first per like company uh, or vendor that they think of. So it's important here uh, to think that uh, to know that awareness alone isn't enough to be remembered. Um, you not only need to be recognized, but you also need to be remembered for the right things. So interestingly here, Salesforce did um, some research and discovered that while lots of people knew who they were and recognized the brand, they didn't actually have any understanding of what they offered. Um, so in response to this, they put together a brand campaign that actually looked at building uh, memories and attached associations um, uh, to what they actually do, as well as like uh, as well as like associations to their brand. Now, I, I mean, we can definitely resonate with this for a long time. I think 
before really uh, consolidating on our content and like making sure we had enough product content out there, we talked about, we put out a lot of different uh, thought leadership and high level content. And quite often we had to get feedback as well at the same time saying, you know, I love your content, but I actually have no idea what you do. Uh, I think part of the uh, great thing about like being memorable in brand marketing is like being able to, you know, get that tie between not only being memorable, not only creating some something great, but also making sure that people actually know what you do at the same time. Um, I think this is where things often get lost as well. Like when people talk about great campaigns that might be super entertaining or make people laugh, but actually the best ways of doing it is tying that back to your finding some way of tying that back to what you do and who you are as, uh, as a company so that people are not only entertained or educated, but also know and are aware of you at the same time. So how do pe how do you make people think of you when you go in market? So associating your brand, really what, what, how, what we're describing is associating your brand with category entry points. So these are triggers that happen in any B2B buyer's life that cause them to go in market for a product. And the idea here is that you associate yourself with many of these uh, category entry points as possible. So that when that sort of event happens in a buyer's life, your company pops into their mind uh, and, they, uh, and then you're added to the list of vendors they'll be looking at. So the way that we would do this and like a common category entry point that we would we play up to all the time, we do lots of content on, is we know that one of our core use cases uh, for Cognizant uh, for salespeople is cold calling. Uh, and there's probably lots, there's lots of different events and things that can happen around cold calling, loads of things that can go wrong, things that might irritate you. Um, so we create content around cold calling, um, how you can increase your cold calling success. We want to be that the company, essentially, if you think about it, uh, that if you are um, if you call a number and the number doesn't work and you think, oh, damn it, this is, you know, this is irritating. I'm, I'm facing this problem every day. The, they, the first people they think of is Cognizant because we've talked about cold calling consistently. And then that ties back to the fact that we also have the data that should be able to prevent them having that same problem uh, daily and day, day in, day out. And so uh, the way we've done this is we have always on content ads on LinkedIn where we're, self, uh, where we're serving these sort of cold calling scripts, guides and trends to sort of pu push ourselves out there for cold calling. We have cold calling webinar series, which serves as training and resources for reps. Um, we work with cold calling uh, subject matter experts like Morgan Ingram to distribute our content and also to add authority to it and, and influence um, our audience. Um, and we have internal sales leaders that also work alongside uh, um, Morgan and also put other content out on their on, on their own link, personal LinkedIn profiles. And this way we're tying ourselves to that category entry point. Um, uh, so if anyone has that, that any problems with cold calling, uh, any problems with their data and cold calling, we should come and spring to mind. And you've got to bake emotion into your marketing. Um, so, I mean, this doesn't mean that you have to, you know, have, you know, it doesn't have to be a John Lewis advert. Um, every time uh, where people are in tears or they're completely blown away. But I think one of the things is that you, we all know from B2B marketing is some of it is especially dry and drab um, and it just, it sparks nothing. Um, so what you want to be able to do is spark emotion through your marketing, such as joy, humor, sympathy, nostalgia, or excitement. Uh, I found this really interesting, actually. I was speaking to LinkedIn um, they uh, the other day um, we we're talking about they have a program called the B2B Edge program where um, they really dig into creatives um, and they found uh, that when testing people's creatives that I think it was around 70% of creatives actually had no, made no difference on the performance of that campaign. So the only thing that actually truly changed performance was increased media spend. And then they compared that to a control of essentially running that creative, that same creative against like a creative of just like almost your logo and a slogan. And it was exactly the same. And actually only another 30% actually have any influence of like one to up to 5% plus improvement on your, um, on that campaign performance. And I think this is part of it. It's just, there's so many creatives that just spark nothing, no emotion, no feeling from it. And then they're not memorable. It's they just blend into the background, just like a creative with just your your um, 
your logo and a, and a tagline would as well. So emotions build memories faster than logic. So by building emotional ties between your brand and your buyer, you actually increase the chance of being recalled later. Um, and then the, the science-y bit here is that's because uh, the emotional bit triggers your amygdala, which is your emotional processing, and the hippocampus, which is part of your episodic memory in your brain. And then this is why you get that, that close tie uh, to, of emotion to memory. Um, I think this is really important because it's really classic for us to think in B2B that, you know, we're all making decisions here about performance. We're making decisions. No one, want, no one gets fired for buying a McDonald's, but they do for buying a CRM. It's a logical decision. Um, and that can make us move away and not and think that we don't need to spark emotion. But they're actually both really important. You can be making a logical decision, but the an emotional impact can lead you or help you to make it as well. So how are we doing this at Cognizant? So um, we love using humor in, in our ads um, and, and a lot of the stuff we do. I think it's a great way to grab people in. It really stands out as well in the B2B market, which can sometimes be really, really boring. Um, and just kind of, you know, almost a bit too serious. Um, so yeah, the easiest way I think we find is to, is to use humor. Uh, it's a great way to add levity to a situation that makes people feel positive emotions. Um, and we try to also add some sort of entertainment value here. So, um, and put that into our content. Um, uh, and here we've got like an example of where, of one of our ads where we've, uh, talking about the topic of lead gen, um, uh, versus demand gen, and we've created Cognizant's lead gen heartbreak mix. Uh, like, had it look so it looks like it's great on Spotify and and matched a ton of uh, to songs to 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 that to the pains that you find with lead gen. Um, and it's got great response. People love it. Um, it's really engaging. And it's and ultimately it's a it's a scroll stopper, right? So uh, it doesn't just blend into the background of your of your LinkedIn profile of your LinkedIn feed, but as people um, you know, stop and like, it, it gives them something to, to focus on. So another way that we do this outside of uh, sparking sort of just humor uh, uh, and like positive emotion that way, I one of the things is, is using a strong point of view. So if someone has a worldview or a way that they understand their industry or their job, they generally feel pretty strongly about it. And that ties in with a lot of emotion. Now, if you confront someone's worldview, with something that challenges it, backed with evidence, you're now tapping into what's called emotional logic. Um, anyone knows this? Uh, we've got Christmas coming up. People have uh, quite intense debates at Christmas with their family. Um, sim simple, innocuous uh, statements from certain family members might send you over the edge, uh, and you'll always remember that conversation afterwards. Uh, it's not dissimilar. Uh, I think if you challenge someone's worldview and you really rile them up, uh, but you can show them and demonstrate uh, where you're coming from, then uh, then yeah, then that that's a great way of getting yourself memory and mem remembered and tapped into that emotional logic. And actually, a great example of this uh, is Chris Walker, who from Refine Labs. Um, some of you might have been swept up in this uh, motion uh, in the last few years when he. He sort of really took down the traditional ways of, of marketing and lead generation. And he actually created, you know, really a, a, a huge fan base of like of, of uh, people who who are con the case became converts, but originally might have been actually lead generation fanatics uh, by combating them with really rational, logical arguments for demand generation, um, which by the time he'd actually then flipped them onto his side, they were like hardcore, passionate uh supporters of it. Um, I mean, you could say exactly the same happened to us at Cognizant. It definitely, uh, definitely got us up in the, in, in his, um, in his influence, um, and worked really well. So, um, creating a, a distinctive brand as well. So this doesn't actually just mean that you start, um, you know, doesn't like, doesn't have to start and, and end with a recognizable logo. Um, you want to sort of create a brand that's sort of unmistakably you. Um, so you want it to aim and look and feel like nobody else so that you're easy identified by customers and easily recalled in, in buying situations. Um, and just like uh, we've got a quote here and just like certain brands that we know, you know, you just see that 
uh, the golden arches, the yellow M for McDonald's. Um, and if you're me, you get extremely excited. Uh, it just works uh, really well. You instantly know who they are. And that's exactly what you want to do by building, um, creating your own distinctive brand. Uh, so how are we doing this at Cognizant? Um, we have a very specific style for um, ads um, and specific tone as well. So like I said, we like to try and weave that humor into it. We like it to be that, that eventually people just stop and they know that it's a Cognizant ad. Uh, by the by either using like the shapes which are really important to our brand uh they give us like a unique sort of identifier in the market we can just put them into other uh, creatives to just give a nod so people immediately can tell that it, it, it's the cognizant brand we've also really worked on a tone of voice um and we that is informal but informative fun and playful uh so that we can be relatable um and people can uh, buy into buy into us as a brand as almost like a human uh rather uh than a company and uh we also have these long-term partnerships with subject matter experts like morgan ingram who then become like associated uh with us uh as a distinct part of the brand as well so then that goes on to i'll pass over to jamie who will talk through all of the tactical brand plays that have worked for us and go through a bit more about what we've actually done uh, and how you could potentially implement it yourself as well. Hi everyone, um, thanks Liam. So yeah, I just wanted to talk through a few specific examples, um, specifically from Cognizant that I think have worked really well in helping to grow our brand in the last few years and helping to make Cognizant a bit more memorable in the minds of our buyers. And I think these examples are all pretty actionable for most b2b brands no matter sort of what size you are who you are how big your team is i think all of this can be replicated um, and that's kind of the reasons one of the reasons we wanted to share um so i'll just start off luke can you go to the next slide thanks liam <laughs> um so yeah so i just want to start off first one is investing in entertaining content um so i think a big reason why entertaining content can be really effective in b2b um for helping to grow the brand and to be more memorable is it speaks back to a little bit what liam was talking about earlier is that when you start putting entertaining content out to the market um it triggers an emotional response and um uses emotional triggers um that goes beyond what's possible with sort of traditional b2b formats um and when you do that you start to form an emotional connection uh with your buyer that basically makes it far easier for them to be able to remember you and recall you later down the line and stay front of mind um versus like your competition or other b2b brands because you form that emotional connection you've given them a positive experience um and it makes it that a little bit easier for them to recall you later on. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it works. But I think something important to take away from this in terms of entertaining content is that we're not obviously putting out entertaining content just for the sake of like entertaining the audience. That's not what we're trying to accomplish. Um, for some context, last year, we started working with Abey Durrani and Todd Clauser, who are two excellent content marketers. Um, and if anyone doesn't follow them on LinkedIn, I highly recommend um going to check them out um basically we started working with them last year and they worked with us in basically rethinking how we approached our content strategy um and we put something in place called the easy mode content framework which is a framework that they invented um and come up with basically to take us beyond what we were doing before which was very much more traditional b2b formats content formats give us more structure more of a strategy i'm not going to go through all of that here i'd highly recommend checking out a previous episode of the loop where we go directly into the easy mode framework or you can check out um, our blog online about it as well and um, really go through the whole thing but i think an important thing to take away from that framework for this in particular is that the way that obeyed and todd broke it down to us is that all of your entertaining content should play a role in distributing either the strategic narrative that you've articulated you want to put out to the market or loops back into what you do 
um, as, a, as a company, as a product. Um, so ultimately, it should always have some sort of insightful substance within the entertaining concepts that the content you're putting out. There should be some sort of insightful substance and some sort of takeaway for the audience that links back into that narrative or what you do um, to make it relevant. Because ultimately, again, we're not trying to create entertaining content for the sake of it. There is um, there is a method behind what we're doing. Um, and there's a reason um, that we're trying to build insightful substance into it as well. But I'd highly recommend checking out these mode content framework stuff um, that we've done previously to get some more info on that. Um, but in terms of entertaining content, I think one thing I wanted to quickly cover off was that I think one of the things that B2B brands, and we definitely struggled with, um, and are still learning, um, is basically where to get started um, and what sort of like you can, um, what content formats you can invest at, uh, invest in to get started with. Um, so Liam, can you just move to the next slide for me? So I just wanted to share a few concepts and ideas that have worked well for us uh, and we've leaned on um, over the last year, especially since we've been working with uh, Ben and Todd. Um, but I'll just start with building email nurtures on creative concepts or themes. So on the left, you'll see there's an email. That's actually an email from a closed lost ops nurture um, that we basically built that email on the concept that it's being sent from a clingy or jealous ex. Um, and basically by doing that, by building the whole email nurture on that concept, what it does is it opens up space for you to then start inserting much more easily uh, things like metaphor, um, humor, and cultural references that one, make the email stand out in the inbox and look like nothing else in the inbox because it's been built upon that concept. Um, and two, actually makes the email nurture an entertaining experience for the buyer. Um, even though this email, like its primary function is to engage close off ops, um, it's not there to <laughs> for sort of brand purposes necessarily, but by creating that entertaining experience for the buyer, it also has the additional effect of creating a positive experience, which enhances our brand and helps make us more memorable. And hopefully down the line, uh, makes us easier to recall um, as a brand. And I think this is something that any B2B marketing team can do. Obviously, there's it takes some ideation. It does take some work. Um, but I would encourage if you can build your email nurtures on like creative concepts or themes, it can really, um, one, make the email much more effective, but two, create a really positive experience um, that enhances your brand and makes you more memorable. Um, the second um, idea I wanted to get across was taking inspiration from creators on social, so YouTube, uh, TikTok, et cetera, and applying that back into B2B. Because um, this has definitely been a source of sort of ideas and um, some of our biggest sort of like um, content uh, hits basically over the last year has definitely been inspired by that space. So on this example on screen right now, there's um, basically, we did a video with one of our SMEs, uh, Morgan Ingram. Um, so he's a SME influencer um, in the sales space. Um, and we did a video with him where we basically took him um, down to London Bridge and had him try out um, cold call openers to random members of the public um, in the middle of the day on London Bridge and just film their reactions to those openers. Um, and so this kind of links back to what I was talking about a minute ago. Like there's insightful substance, like there's something relevant within the content, like it's about cold calling. Um, it links back to um, the basically uh, getting, re getting a reaction from the public and the reaction to those openers are some of the insightful substance. And you can learn something from those reactions and from those cold call openers. But it's built on an entertaining concept, which is basically Morgan going to London Bridge um, and getting reactions from the public in the middle of the day um, and filming those reactions um, on the spot in real time. Um, but yeah, we've done a couple of things like this. We also did um, a, a video recently of myself and Katana Donati, who's um, another excellent marketer we work with, um, basically doing a reaction video where I reacted to American ads and he reacted to British ads. Um, and you can kind of see like from that idea and this London Bridge idea, all of that sort of been inspired by what creators are doing online um, 
uh, in a more general sense on YouTube, TikTok, etc. So I'm really just thinking about how can you take those ideas and apply them in a B2B context to what you're doing and make it relevant to either the messaging and narrative you're putting out or tie it back to your product in a way. Um, but I highly recommend using the, that sort of um, that space as inspiration for your entertainment content ideas. Um, and yeah, next thing I just wanted to touch on as well was starting to build out content series so entertaining series of content so this was something that obeyed and todd definitely impressed upon us when we were working with them um about a year ago was ultimately anyone who's sort of tried to start to ideate and build um, entertaining content for b2b it does take lift it does take um, a lot of ideation um so they definitely really impress upon that if you can start to build repeatable series um, to shortcut your ideation, it can be really, really effective um, in actually being enabling you as a company to be pushing out entertaining content to the audience you're targeting with it um, regularly and making it effective um, and being able to distribute your message in an entertaining way. Um, so a couple of ideas that we've used, one's here. Uh, we actually had um, our, um, so members of our uh, marketing team who look after our sales persona, they've started up a series called Rate My Cold Call. Um, where they have members of, um, so they have SDRs and salespeople send in their cold calls to our SMEs. So Morgan and also other um, uh, well-known figures in the sales space. And they uh, basically react and rate those cold calls um, in video content um, and like roast them or praise them, depending on how good or bad the cold call is. Um, and they basically use that as a repeatable series that they're putting out again and again, again, it links back to some insightful substance because they're getting learnings from those influencers as well. And the entertainment does come from um, the reactions to the content as well. Um, another thing that we're currently working on and should be released soon in the new year um, is actually we're going to be doing a parody um, of a game show that was common in Britain uh, in the 80s and 90s called Play Your Cards Right. Um, and that will actually be called Play Your Ads Right. Um, we're basically going to be having our head of paid acquisition, um, basically rating Cognizant's ads um, across personas and um, across our business units, um, rating, have two contestants come on, um, and we'll be guessing each other's ads, what's done better and what didn't, um, and basically doing that in a nice, fun, entertaining way. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, but you can kind of see how we're building repeatable series to try and get that entertaining content out regularly. Um, and then finally, Liam touched on this a little bit, um, but really investing in entertaining ad concepts um, and like mean style ads, for example, um, like on the screen now, this ad is it's a product ad. So its primary function is is product marketing. Like we're trying to articulate um, a problem that we solve with this ad. But because Cognizant has really invested in creating a very distinct ad style, um, which are humorous um, and lighthearted often. Um, and we often use memes and very like funny cultural references. Um, because we've invested in that style of ad, what we often find, especially when we're at like events or talking to other marketers, one of the first things they come up to us and say is like, oh, they love our ads or they know us because of our ads and we saw this ad. Um, and what it's actually done, even though it's a product ad um, and we have many like this, um, they've actually inversely helped to make us more memorable because they're entertaining. Um, so I'd highly recommend if you can start experimenting, testing, entertaining ads that stop people in the feed um, and give them an entertaining experience as well as like selling your product and articulating um, and educating the audience about your product. Um, yeah, I think that if, investing time and effort into creating an entertaining ad that stops in the feed um, can be really worthwhile for your brand as well. Um, cool. I think we can move to the next slide, Liam. Uh, the next thing I just wanted to touch on briefly as well was, um, and I think this has been really important for the growth of Cognizant and for the growth of our brand, especially in recent years, um, is building in public. So we've always been very open up front about what we're doing, what we're learning, uh, what we're testing at Cognizant. Um, and I think the best example of the power of building public for Cognizant is specifically when when we were transitioning from lead gen to demand gen, so I actually wasn't even here when this was first happening, actually. But Alice, our CMO, and Liam and Fran were all very publicly giving a very like blow by blow account of that process. They were like literally building in public, explaining how that process was going, how they made the switch, 
given a very transparent lens into the results behind the scenes, how it was working, how they were structuring the team, all of those things they were posting about, they were sharing. Um, and it played, we, at the time, it was definitely riding on a wave of, like, there was a very strong demand gen narrative out there. Chris Walker was, like, definitely first sort of coming on the scene as well and having a lot of success and Cognizant really got swept up in that wave and were building in public alongside that. Um, and it definitely played a really big role in making Cognizant um, more known among marketers and starting to build um, more emotional connections between the Cognizant brand and marketers as well. Um, and I think one of the reasons why building public works so well is that it does tap into something we talk about a lot in marketing, which is uh, storytelling. So I think by Liam and Fran and Alice and all the people inside the company publicly sharing that information, giving a behind the scenes look, um, showing what was happening um, when they were making that switch and explain in very transparent terms. I think that did a few things. I think it helped foster trust between the audience um, and people behind the scenes, so Liam, Fran and Alice. Um, I think it helped establish some credibility um, with the audience and it helped bring the audience um, with them as they were going through that process um, and basically did what all good stories do, which is basically get them invested in the brand by um basically bringing them with them as that story is being told um and i think yeah again to be honest i think any b2b brand can any b2b marketer and any b2b brand can do this um i think it's possible for any b2b brand to talk about what they're doing talk about their experiences talk about what they're testing talk about what they're learning um and start to build more emotional connections between the people in the company and um and their audience and in turn that helps to foster a sense of uh, connection between the brand and the buyers as well um but yeah i'd highly recommend um investing some time in that um and start sharing what you're doing um cool then we can move to the next slide leo um and yeah next one and this has definitely been something that's i think guided cognizant's content strategy um, and approach for the last few years um overall is the philosophy of giving more um than we take um so I think ultimately what we try and do with our content is we don't want to ask for stuff in return. We obviously don't follow the sort of um, the traditional lead gen gated approach. Um, we do give everything upfront ungated. Um, and I think one of the reasons we've really gone down that route is that we want our content to basically provide enough value upfront that we earn the, the trust of our audience and earn their time and attention to stay front of mind long term um so that we actually let the content speak for itself to be able to stay front of mind with that buyer um so that if they ever do need a product like ours we're going to be top of mind when that happens um and i think one of the reasons why this approach works for us and has worked for other companies as well as i think it taps into especially if anyone's what read robert chiedini's book um influence um he talks about his laws of persuasion and one of those um is reciprocity um, which basically states that humans are hardwired to return favors. Uh, and I think this approach really plays into that, to be honest. I think if you really invest time in giving more than you're asking for in return, this does help foster um, positive affinity between yourself and your buyer um, and creates positive experiences, which, again, fosters an emotional connection between your brand and your buyers, which in turn helps you make helps make you easier to recall down the line and helps make your brand memorable um and i think this is just an outlook and an approach um, versus like one-off actions um and it's something we've definitely indexed heavily at cognizant it's definitely been a big part of the growth of our brand um the last few years um so yeah another thing i would think people should take on board and think about um and testing themselves if they don't necessarily follow this sort of ungated or value upfront approach cool i think we can move to the next slide Liam. Um, and yeah, finally, um, yeah, Liam talked to talk, touch on this slightly, but we definitely really invested in trying to infuse strong POVs into our content. Um, so ultimately, what we're trying to do, I think, especially in the era we're in now, where a lot of people are very much talking about like AI content and chat GPT and how that's going to affect content moving forward. I think this is only going to become more and more important um, over the next few years. Um, ultimately, a good POV should do a couple of things. But first and foremost, 
um, it should take a stance that differentiates your content in the mind of buyers, which in turn helps differentiate the brand in the mind of buyers, which helps make you more memorable. Um, and then two, like Liam said earlier, if the POV can confront people's worldview and change the way they think about things, you tap into emotional logic, which generates an emotional response, which again helps to separate you in the mind of buyers and you become a memorable brand. Um, and I think POVs are definitely one of the areas that most B2B marketing teams can invest their time in um, as it's something that um, is available. It's just a case of you constructing uh, the POVs yourself. But I think those, that's an area someone, uh, any B2B marketing team can think about and infuse it into their content uh, for better results. And it's definitely worked well for us um, in the last year or two. Um, so definitely uh, would recommend thinking about that and potentially start testing some of that out. Um, cool. Um, so the last thing we just wanted to touch on was uh, measurement, because um, obviously sort of the crutch of uh, this sort of issue is that a lot of this stuff that we've talked about, a lot of this activity, a lot of this top of funnel activities, brand activity tends to be deprioritized um, and often um, put to the side because a lot of people consider it not to be measurable and it's like a lot of it is untrackable. Um, so what I wanted to touch on was a few different ways that we think you can use to measure a few different methods to actually measure this activity a few things that we're doing at cognizant right now um and also a few things that when we've had conversations with marketers on our podcast for example um some suggestions that they've made as well so we've sort of compiled a list of things that you can take away and i think you can start doing right away um that can you can use to basically measure your brand and, and top of final activity um so the first thing we'll talk about, and this actually came from a conversation I had recently with Drew Spencer Leahy, who's um, the product marketing director at Hockey Stack. Um, and he basically was just discussing the role of surveys in sort of measuring your brand activity. Um, and he talked me through one scenario where basically this links back to what Liam was talking earlier. If you have a set number of um, category entry points that you're trying to own or associations that you want your brand to own, um, you can go out and use surveys to one, find a baseline uh, for what your audience is kind of, does Does your audience actually interpret, associate you with those associations and those category entry points? Um, so you can ask questions such as um, like, what do they think you sell? What words would they use to describe your business? What reasons? Um, would someone buy from you? Um, what content adverts recently have you seen that they recall? Um, and you can use sort of questions like that and a survey like that to essentially build a baseline. Um, and in any areas you think are lacking from uh, that, that initial survey, you can go out, build campaigns and build activity uh, to try and improve upon those areas. Um, and then again, in six, nine, 12 months, whatever sort of uh, timeline you decide upon, uh, you can run that survey again and see if you discover any improvements. Um, obviously, that's not uh, something you can do. It's not something that's going to give you immediate insights um, uh, week to week or, or month to month. But it's definitely a really useful measure to know if your brand building efforts are one, if you're building the right associations and building relevant awareness. Um, and if your brand building efforts are actually doing what you're intending them to. Um, and I think that's actually a really practical way that a lot of brands could start to measure this stuff. So that's one way. Uh, definitely we'd recommend potentially trying out. Um, I think move to the next slide, Liam. Uh, a second way you can measure the success of your brand efforts is by measuring baseline sales growth. So in any organization, there should be a level of growth that comes to you organically because your brand building efforts are working. So if you were to take away all of the short term uh, campaigns, offers, discounts, efforts, if you were to take that out, there would still be a baseline sales and revenue um, figure that would come into the business based on uh, your brand building efforts. Um, so if you can sort of figure that number out and then start tracking if that's increasing over time, it can be a really useful measure for you internally to know if your brand building efforts are going in the right direction and to be able to tell that story externally um, upwards to executives, for example. Um, so, yeah, the, the only trouble with this is that sometimes I think people uh, can get very sophisticated in trying to just in trying to figure out their baseline sales and baseline revenue. Um, and that can be tricky. But even if you're keeping it simple and just sort of like taking away your short term campaigns and offers and um, efforts, 
Um, if you can just look at that number and still see that number tracking upwards, um, you can still use that as a measure and it can be a useful tool for you. Um, so yeah, another, again, another way that I think most B2B marketers can use. Um, okay, move to the next slide, Liam. Uh, another way uh, here is branded search. So I think this is actually really important and is a really, um, really easy measure for any B2B marketer to start measuring the effect of their brand efforts. So basically measuring how many people are searching for your company name on search engines. Because um, basically, if they're Googling your name and they remember your brand exists and this number is increasing over time, it's a really good indication that your brand efforts are working, you're increasing awareness. Um, and people becoming more aware of your brand as well. Um, to take this a step further, you can also look at share search. So you can start comparing how many branded searches in your get, how many branded searches you're getting versus your competitors, um, and then again tracking whether that share of search is going up over time. Um, and again, I think it's another useful measure, um, another practical way for most B two B marketers uh, to start measuring this stuff. Um, and yeah, and finally, a couple more things we definitely pay attention to at Cognizant um, is one, engagement. So engagement, we definitely view as very, very important in terms of measuring your brand efforts. We don't believe it's a vanity metric. Instead, it's a really important way to tell if your audience uh, is liking and knows about your brand. Um, so you can look at things like growth and follower count, growth and engagement rates. Um, are they following your um your company in relevant communities and in multiple places. Um, I think in isolation, these things can be significant at times, but when blended together and looked at as a full picture, they can be really, really reliable measures to know if your brand efforts are going the right way and can be really useful you for you as a marketer to interpret, are you doing the right things in your brand efforts and are things scaling in the way you want? Um, so definitely don't ignore these and consider these vanity metrics. Look at the full picture, look at how they're, um, how they're tracking over time and use that um, to start measuring your brand efforts. Um, and second, I'm sure a lot of people heard about this by now, but self-reported attribution. So basically using a how did you hear about us question um, in your high intent forms. So things like your demo forms. Um, so basically inserting that there um, to figure out what was the first place that that buyer, as they're converting, figure out what was the first place they heard about you um, and sort of entered into your orbit, basically. Um, and then you can start to see if things like your brand efforts, so things like your LinkedIn channel, your podcast, your webinars, specific content pieces, if that comes up in the self-attribution uh, responses, then you've got a pretty good measure that your brand efforts are working and that they're actually bringing people into your orbit and making people aware of you and ultimately leading to business down the line. Um, I think as well, just another thing you can do with this, um, there's plenty of ways of doing it, a little bit over my head, um, but there's ways of automating this process so you can bucket responses from your self-attribution form. We use a tool called Hockey Stack, um, which is an attribution tool. Um, so we basically use Hockey Stack to automate bucketing together responses into categories. Um, and for example, like I looked at that, was that report the other day and I could see that of the responses that have been bucketed under word of mouth, um, Hockey Stack actually allows you to see um, how much pipeline um, correlates next to, basically correlates to that bucket. Um, uh, and we could see that I think it was like 1.3 million in pipeline over the last 90 days had been linked to that word of mouth bucket. It's not scientific, but ultimately it's a very useful tool for us to be able to tell the story and also give us an indication that our word of mouth efforts and our brand efforts are working to an extent. Um, and it actually ties back into revenue um, it's correlated to revenue down the line as well. Um, so yeah, I think there's a few ways you can do that. I'm pretty sure there's ways to do it through HubSpot and Salesforce, et cetera. Um, but that's everything for me. Um, yeah, happy to answer any question you guys have got. Um, and yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, sorry, I jumped the gun then. I thought you were coming to the end. <laughs> Didn't mean to, to cut you off. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, uh, go ahead. We'd love to be able to answer them and, and create any discussion here. I think we have, hey, Liam, hey, Jamie. Enjoying the show, curious as to how much of the Cognizant client base is tending to implement creative brand marketing efforts unsure is my answer but we're fighting the good fight we're trying to trying to lead the way so but it could be a really interesting uh it's a really interesting point it's a really interesting thing that we could actually survey the the customer base on and see um 
you know how people are working towards it you know we're always trying to show actually the best ways to you know use our data to do marketing as well so um that's kind of the 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 mission behind all of our efforts i think we've got one more um from charlie hills in the chat how are you navigating a cookie-less world yeah uh, that's <laughs> yeah it's interesting i mean we use tools like hockey stack which um are cookie in their um in their makeup so um and that helps us with uh, with the reporting so uh i'm not actually i can't remember they have a really good obviously product piece on their website about how they track without cookies um but it enables you to uh see another side of all those people who don't accept um accept your cookies when landing on the website um at the moment obviously we cookies are still in use so we we have like both and we look at attribution um from utms and cookie uh, and tracking um uh cookies as well and then we have uh hockey sack which is cookieless and then we also use the self-reported attribution which um is relies on them filling out that attribution as well so that doesn't require cookies as well um in terms of like how going further than that and how cookies are infected in retargeting and stuff like that uh at the moment obviously we still retarget based on cookies and and those will be uh but we have a huge number of um ads that are based on linkedin and native targeting and cognizant data which means that we're targeting those not just for our retargeting campaigns is just one thin slither of of all the paid uh, tar- uh advertising that we're doing um so that would be my my answer to that but we're not quite we're not cookie free we'll still make use of them whilst they're still here cool we had one from alan thomas i was actually keen to crack, take a crack at which is um what best practices can you share for implementing these strategies on a small budget um and i would just go back on that alan um that i think there's a few things that we put in presentation that i i do think that most b2b marketers and brands can do like right away so i think there's a couple of things i would recommend so like if you're on a small budget i think that there's definitely opportunity for you to identify the most relevant people in your organization um to start building in public and sharing insights in public um and sharing an insight into the organization. Um, so for us, like we do sell to marketers. So we have like Liam and Alice and Fran that are constantly sharing things with our audience. Um, but if you, for example, uh, work in um, IT security, there might be people in, your, in, in like security teams that might be relevant, getting those people posting, identifying people who are willing to post and start sharing things internally relevant to buyers. Um, I think that's definitely something that anyone can do. Um, and then I think the most important thing when you're on a small budget, for, particularly for stuff that we've talked about just now, is whatever you're doing. So if you're running ads or if you're just doing email, um, it's really starting to think about how you can bake entertaining concepts into the assets that you're putting out. Um, and I think that this, the most straightforward way to do that is through humor. I think that's the best place to start. Um, and I think the best way to start bringing humor into either your emails or your ads or whatever sort of um, collateral you're putting out to the market um, is to really start with the problems that you're solving um, and figure out what are the common narratives and POVs and cliches in your industry, identify those things um, and start poking fun at them. Um, Start looking at what creators are doing online, look at memes, um, look at things that you can sort of draw inspiration from and apply it to those POVs, those cliches, those problems. Um, and I think that's a pretty um, straightforward way for people to get started um, in terms of building a more um, memorable brand is, is starting to build entertaining concepts into their content. Um, it's not easy, but it's like somewhere that anyone can start no matter what budget you're on. And then we have another one here um from johnny so hockey sex sounds interesting where sales organization too we want to see metrics such as email response rates and brand awareness um wondering you have any way for marketing could track consultants performance um 
based on email responses, post interactions. Um, yes, so this is a good question. Um, we, in terms of like when we're like sort of build, building out, which I suppose could work the same, our own like internal influencers, um, as we like our internal subject matter experts on sales and the marketing side, we use a tool called Shield, which tracks sort of like growth in followers. Um, top posts, the people, um, performance of those posts and built and those profiles. Um, they, that is on an individual level again, though, and I'm sure there must be other tools out there that provide, um, we'll be able to take it from like a larger, like, and, and be able to take it from like a top down view of the organization. Um, but we're actually not using one, um, in terms of, yeah, email responses as well. It's a good question. I will actually find out for you, uh, exactly from our SCR leadership. Um, how we're doing that. I know we use um, Outreach as our sales engagement tool, but I'm not actually sure if that tracks it itself, but um, we'll find out. But um, yeah, agreed. Like once you, if you're able to track all of that together, then you can get sort of a good idea of um, of like how the whole organization is doing. I think we've got a final question for Balaji, and I think that's the last one, Liam. Uh, yeah. So it was um, many B2B, B2Bs maybe bought into the concept of doing brand marketing, but run out of resources and runway. They have the same staff doing pipeline generation and content creation. How have you balanced all this uh, cognizant? Um, Leo, I don't know if you want to go back on this one, but I think it's important. I think basically it's important to draw a distinction that we're quite a big team. So it does obviously play a, play a role. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I think the thing is, yeah, we are a big team, which is helpful. Like, um, I know if you're a smaller team, like, uh, you're going to be stretched in every way, every direction, um, especially if you're a solo marketer too. But I do think a lot of this stuff can be combined together. And even when we're a smaller team, we were always able to sort of like churn out the the content, create this. And I think that the idea that brand and like demand have to differ so much is maybe where some of that falls down uh we feel like we have to do activity that's specific to brand marketing we have to then do specifically activity that's specific to demand marketing when actually you know good demand marketing is great brand activity great brand marketing generates demand and that's the best way to look at it and you can solve and all of that really comes from the core of great content so if you're creating great content um that gen that can be like used to build create demand and and it's also therefore the quality of the content pushes out your brand then you can find a way of kind of doing it all at once and and that's kind of what we've done we've always focused on that content engine first and then after that uh actually all the bits all the how we set up our sort of like distribution of that is kind of secondary to the to the content uh so as long as you focus on creating the great content then you can distribute it uh like in the in, in the best way possible after that so that that would actually be my way of talking about of how you balance it is focus on content first that will contribute to all of your um contribute will have all that contribution to pipeline in the end and also to brand yeah so. i think i just add i think i just add to that as well actually um like, like you said like it's helpful for cognizant at the moment because we have a big team so we're able to do really big like campaigns and really big things that is really interesting and that's that's great um but ultimately like i think if i was in a smaller team um, and wanted to commit to some this activity i think what would be in my mind is that ultimately you're never going to be able to do everything you want <laughs> so i suppose it just boils down to any sort of um being in any sort of marketing team like you need to make choices and you need to um commit to what you think is going to be the highest leverage um activities um and basically like that might mean that for your brand activity because of the resources you have and the manpower you have that might be restricted to one activity or one thing you're doing but it just depends on what resources you have available to you so i suppose it just comes back to sort of making choices and prioritizing basically um but yeah i think it just but that would be one thing i'd say really is just it doesn't need to be to do brand marketing you don't need to be doing huge like massive campaigns like yeah that's great and that's if you can do that brilliant but like if there's smaller bits you can do it might just be um content on linkedin or um like having your sme share 
um, content on LinkedIn. That That's also, that can be something that you work on for a quarter or however long. Cool, I think we're all out. I think that's everything. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming today. Thanks for asking your questions as well and listening. Um, if you need, uh, if you have any more questions or want to reach out, um, please just, yeah, connect with us on LinkedIn um, and ping us a message. Um, always, always happy to help. But yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone.